Hey everybody, this is your buddy Carl for a daily Bible reading. It is the daily Bible reading late edition. I know here in Nashville it's not almost 9.45 p.m. in the evening. And like normal people, my work schedule changes, responsibilities shift. Sometimes I don't read in the morning. I have other things or I just get busy and I even forget. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to get my daily Bible reading in. So anyway, just bless you. Just to show you, it's this isn't like a corporate reading. I'm just doing life like many of you. And you find a way to, to chew on the word when you can. Uh, you could have it read to you in your car. Or when you want to, I suggest you read it. There's something about you hearing, and even you hearing it out loud is good. Or you can read along with me. But anyway, here you go. For July the 16th, July 16th of 2020 is a Thursday. So I just bless you on this July 16th. Let's pick it up right here. Remember, David wants to bring the tabernacle back, and he paid for the threshing floor to offer it. He was afraid to go anywhere because the angel of the Lord is hovering over the city with the sword, and God has restrained uh, more destruction, right? So if you've been reading along, if you've missed it, go back and check out 21 or the previous day. But here we go. July 16th. Uh, First Chronicles chapter 22 and 23. Then David said, This will be the location for the temple of the Lord God and the place of the altar for Israel's burnt offerings. So David gave orders to call together the foreigners living in Israel. He assigned them the task of preparing finished stone for building the temple of God. David provided large amounts of iron for the nails that would be needed for the doors in the gates and for the clamps, and he gave more bronze than could be weighed. How about that? He also provided innumerable cedar logs, for the men of Tyre and Sidon had brought vast amounts of cedar to King David. David said, My son Solomon is still young and inexperienced, and since the temple to be built for the Lord must be a magnificent structure, famous and glorious throughout the world, I will begin by making preparations for it now. Good. So David collected vast amounts of building materials before his death. So remember, David doesn't get to build the Lord's temple, right? This is going to be Solomon's call because the Lord said because of David's history, even though he loves God, this was an interesting deal. God says, no, you don't get to build the temple, but your son will build it. And so we'll see this later. So there you go. Verse 6, Then David sent for his son Solomon and instructed him to build a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel. My son, I wanted to build a temple to honor the name of the Lord my God, David told him. But the Lord said to me, You have killed many men in the battles you have fought, and since you have shed so much blood in my sight, you will not be the one to build a temple to honor my name. But you will have a son who will be a man of peace. Hmm. So much to unpack there. Because a lot of David's victories, the Lord gave David victories, made him strong and powerful. And yet, don't you ask that question like, Lord, you helped David succeed. You made him a conqueror, a warrior, a musician, a worshiper, a king. And yet you're holding it from him to build the temple. I'm sure there are scholarly discussions about that, but we just have to move on, at least for the daily reading, and we will. So remember, Solomon is a man of peace. In his time, there was no war. There, were peace, there was peace in Israel on every side. That's what I remember in a previous chapter on King Solomon. All right, here we go. Wow. So, but you will have a son. This is what the Lord told David, that will be a man of peace. I will give him peace with his enemies in all the surrounding lands. His name will be Solomon. And I will give peace and quiet to Israel during his reign. Isn't that amazing? He is the one who will build the temple to honor my name. He will be my son and I will be his father. I will secure the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. 
Now, my son, may the Lord be with you and give you success as you follow his directions in building the temple of the Lord your God. And may the Lord give you wisdom and understanding that you may obey the law of the Lord your God as you rule over Israel. For you will be successful if you carefully obey the decrees and regulations that the Lord gave to Israel through Moses. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or lose heart. I have worked hard to provide materials for building the temple of the Lord. Nearly 4,000 tons of gold. Pause. 4,000 tons of gold. Wow. 40,000 tons of silver. And so much iron and bronze that it cannot be weighed. Wow. Wow. I have also gathered timber and stone for the walls, though you may, though, though you may need to add more. <laughs> you have a large number of skilled stonemasons and carpenters and craftsmen of every kind. You have expert goldsmiths and silversmiths and workers of bronze and iron. Now begin the work, and may the Lord be with you. So David is commissioning Solomon right here. Verse 17, then David ordered all the leaders of Israel to assist Solomon in this project. The Lord your God is with you, he declared. He has given you peace with surrounding nations. He has handed them over to me, and they are now subject to the Lord and his people. Now seek the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. Build the sanctuary of the Lord God so that you can bring the ark of the Lord's covenant and the holy vessels of God into the temple built to honor the Lord's name. Wow. Powerful. Okay, I'm going to read on. July 16th, chapter 23, also in First Chronicles. Here we go. So, when David was an old man, he appointed his son Solomon to be king. So, see, there you go. King David made Solomon king. He wasn't going to have a conspiracy so that Solomon wouldn't get the throne. So he's king over Israel. David summoned all the leaders of Israel together with the priests and the Levites. All the Levites were 30 years old or older were counted, and the total came to 38,000. Then David said, From all the Levites, 24,000 will supervise the work at the temple of the Lord. Another 6,000 will serve as officials and judges. I, I, we can't even picture this kind of workforce, like a city of men called on to build the Lord's temple. And it would take that with this massive project, especially in that time. They didn't have power tools. <laughs> Everything's done by hand. Another 4,000 will work as gatekeepers, and 4,000 will praise the Lord with the musical instruments I have made. Pause. King David was a designer. He made musical instruments. So we have, I, I've got to do some research. What kind of instruments did David make? Then David divided the Levites into divisions named after the clans descended from the three sons of Levi. Remember that? Gershon, Gohath, and Merari. Okay, there you go. The Gershonites, all the tribes of Gershon. The Gershonite family units were, divide, were defined by their lines of descent from Libni and Shimea, or Sh sorry, Sh Shimei, the sons of Gershon. Three of the descendants of Libni were Jael, the family leader, Zitham, and Joel. These were the leaders of the family of Libni. Three of the descendants of Shimei were Shelamoth, Haziel, and Haran. Four other descendants of Shimei were Jahath, Ziza, Jeush, and Bariah. Jahath was the family leader, and Ziza was next. Jeush and Barea were counted as a single family because neither had many sons. Four of the descendants of Kohath were Amram, Izhar, Hebron, and Uziel. The sons of Amram were Aaron and Moses. Aaron and his descendants were set apart to dedicate the most holy things, to offer sacrifices in the Lord's presence, to serve the Lord, and to pronounce blessings in his name forever. As for Moses... The man of God, his sons were included with the tribe of Levi. The sons of Moses were Gershom and Eleazar. The descendants of Gershom included Shabuel, the family leader. Eleazar, or Eleazar, had only one son, Rehabiah. 
the family leader. So Rehabiah had numerous descendants. The descendants of Ishar included Shelomith, the family leader. The descendants of Hebron included Jariah, the family leader, Amariah, the second, and Jahaziel, the third, and Jechamim, the fourth. The descendants of Uziel included Micah, the family leader, and Ishia, the second. The descendants of Merari included Mali and Mushi. The sons of Mal Mali were Eliezer and Kish. Eliezer died with no sons, only daughters. His daughters married their cousins, the sons of Kish. Three of the descendants of Mushi were Mali, Eder, and Jeremoth. These were the descendants of Levi by clans, the leaders of their family groups registered carefully by name. You notice that this was the way the Israelites kept track of lineage, very important. So a lot of times when we read Old Testament, we see that and say like, why, why? But for these people, they had a name and a story and a purpose. We're just given the names, right? So I haven't looked for other writings about family histories, but this is why we know Jesus came through these lines, by the way. So that's important in terms of biblical history. Moving on. Um, each had, let me see, these were the descendants of Levi clans, the leaders of their family groups registered carefully by name. Each had to be 20 years old or older to qualify for service in the house of the Lord. For David said, the Lord, the God of Israel, has given us peace and he will always live in Jerusalem. Now the Levites will no longer need to carry the tabernacle and its furnishings from place to place. In accordance with David's final instructions, all the Levites, 20 years old or older, were registered for service. So there you go. See, very much documented lineage, registering for work. That's a major calling for the, for the people. All right, moving on, verse 28 of chapter 23. The work of the Levites was to assist the priests, the descendants of Aaron, as they served at the house of the Lord. They also took care of the courtyards and side rooms, helped perform the ceremonies of purification, and served in many other ways in the house of God. They were in charge of the sacred bread that was set out on the table, the choice flour for the grain offerings, the wafers made without yeast, the cakes cooked in olive oil, and the other mixed breads. They were also responsible to check all the weights and measures. And each morning and evening they stood before the Lord to sing songs of thanks and praise to him. They assisted with burnt offerings that were presented to the Lord on Sabbath days and new moon celebrations and at all the appointed festivals. The required number of Levites served in the Lord's presence at all times, following all the procedures they had been given. And so, under the supervision of the priest, the Levites watched over the tabernacle and the temple and faithfully carried out their duties of service at the house of the Lord. So there you go. That's how it worked out and how they were chosen. It's always the tribe of Levites or the Levi, Lev, Levi tri, Levi's tribe, his family line, the Levitical tribe, Aaron's sons had become the priestly order at the temple. Okay. All right. That's July 16th. <clears throat> Today's psalm is Psalm 12, verses 1 through 8. All right, Lord, 16. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. The, here's the theme. And this is King David again, Psalm 12. The theme is the proud and lying words of people versus the true and pure words of God. A call for protection against those who tried to manipulate us. Hmm. Thank you, King David. Psalm 12, for the choir director, a psalm of David to be accompanied by an eight-stringed instrument. Hmm, something to look up on Google. What was King David's eight-stringed instrument? Going to check that out. Help, O Lord, from the God... <laughs> Help, O Lord, for the godly are fast disappearing. Ooh, the faithful have vanished from the earth. Neighbors lie to each other, speaking with flattery lips and deceitful hearts. May the Lord cut off their flattering lips and silence their boastful tongues. They say, we will lie to our heart's content. Our lips are our own. Who can stop us? Oh, dreadful. 
Verse 5, the Lord replies, I have seen violence done to the helpless, and I have heard the groans of the poor. Now I will rise up to rescue them, as they have longed for me to do. The Lord's promises are pure, like silver refined in a furnace, purified seven times over. Therefore, Lord, we know you will protect the oppressed, preserving them forever from this lying generation, even though the wicked strut about, and evil is praised throughout the land. Ah, Lord, may it not be in our days. See, even David, <laughs> you know, mankind doesn't change, do they? I've said that before. All right, let's go on. July 16th, today's proverb is Proverbs 19, verses... 13 to 14. A foolish child is a calamity to a father. A quarrelsome wife is as annoying as a constant dripping. Ah, Lord save us. Verse 14, fathers can give their sons an inheritance of houses and wealth, but only the Lord can give an understanding wife. Thank God for an understanding wife. And I have one of those, so not as in the previous one. Yeah, the, the problems in families. See, it didn't change. It's biblical, right? The nature of people. Uh, a foolish child, verse 13, is a clam. It's a shame. When, uh, yeah. May we be good children, and may you have great children, and may they have the fear of God. A quarrelsome wife is as annoying as a constant dripping. I bless husbands and wives with the fear of the Lord and camaraderie and love and compassion for each other and mercy towards each other and love and assisting to each in each other's ways, you know, to get there. Verse 14, just lingering here. Fathers give their sons an inheritance of houses and wealth. Yeah, and we are blessed to have family that can do that. But only the Lord can give an understanding wife. So in the nature of like where we get things, like some people get to inherit wealth, some don't, that doesn't matter. But only God can give us understanding spouses. That's more valuable than our wealth. Remember that. All right, I'm going to move on. I won't preach a sermon. Chewing on that. And sometimes you can do that with Psalms. Get different translations and Proverbs. Think, ah, what is the meaning? What is the interpretation? What's another layer of that understanding? All right, <laughs> July 16th. Uh, let's pick it up at Romans 3. We're going to pick it up at verse 9 and go all the way to 31. Now, I did kind of overlap yesterday because it was so important what Paul was unpacking. Um, Paul here was talking, was speaking to the Jews, right? And uh, remember, he, he was, uh, anyway, verse 9. Uh, yeah, I'm going to pick it up there at 9. Romans 3, verse 9. Well, then, should we conclude that we... Jews are better than others? No. No, not at all. For we have already shown that all people, whether Jews or Gentiles, are under the power of sin. Unless you're in the Lord, by the way. But we suffer in a broken world either way. As the scriptures say, <laughs> no one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good, not a single one. Their talk is foul like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with lies. Snake venom drips from their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. They rush to commit murder. Destruction and misery always follow them. They don't know where to find peace. They have no fear of God at all. Now, this doesn't mean that you know unbelievers can't be good people. He's talking about the depths of mankind in general. And really, he's making the observation, without the Lord, we can't be made righteous. There's nobody that's righteous. No one is righteous, not one. You can't be as holy as God, even if you're a good person, right? Quote, a good person. Can't be, All right? All right, moving on, verse 19. Obviously, the laws applies to those to whom it was given, for its purpose is to keep people from having excuses and to show that the entire world is guilty before God. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. But now God has shown us a way. Ah, okay, I always tell people, don't get stuck in one paragraph or verse. And this is a perfect example. So this is just one chapter. We've been like, Paul's really kind of pouring it out here, getting heavy. And right here at verse 21, he goes, but... 
But wait, listen to me. Let me give you the bigger picture. And that's what Paul's doing. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law as was promised in the writings of the law, of Moses, what he wrote about, and the prophets. So now watch what he's going to do. He's going to point to Jesus. How do we deal with all this imperfection and the broken world and our flaws and our sin and our junk, right? Ah, there it is, Jesus. Verse 22, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned. See, he's going back to like that phrase, there's no one righteous, but who's going to help us, right? Paul is the one unpacking all, all of his knowledge as a, as a Pharisee and then always throwing out this zinger. That's why you've got to read forward, right? For everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. Wow, have to pause. Remember when we read Jesus, you know, we even recited in one of the creeds, right? He descended into hell or the, under, the underworld or the holding ground, whatever, right? Before Jesus came, all of these departed souls were kind of like in limbo, so to speak, when Jesus came and conquered sin and death, he went and released the captives who had believed in his coming, who believed in God, who were already waiting for the righteousness of God to be fulfilled. The righteous requirements of God to be fulfilled had to happen in Christ. Amazing. There you go. And Paul's explaining it. Powerful. For God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. Verse 26, for he was looking ahead, including them in what he would do in this present time. God this, did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just, and he declares sinners to be right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. I'm going to pause here again when people say, Carl, look, God loves everybody. Jesus died for everybody. And I go, yes. The price is paid. The package is delivered. You just have to open it, right? You can't make this stuff up, folks. Scriptures are totally clear. No matter how you translate it, you can't. If you twist the words around and leave things out and try to muddle it, let me see if I, I've heard people do this, like universalists want to like, no, no, you don't understand scripture, Carl. I'm like, yeah, I think I do. And your thing sounds good, like all people are going to be saved, so we don't need to preach, we don't need to share. People don't know, need to know Christ. They actually think this. For those of you that think that's a surprise, yeah, there's that. When you hear the term universalist, they think that. And I'm, I'm like, I know it sounds like oh, that would be so beautiful. But scripture, I, I'd have to like chop, chop up the Bible. I know that. Give me scissors and I'll take out some pages so you can be right. It would be easier, right? We think. But then we wouldn't be redeemed. We wouldn't be pulled into redemption. So, oh, okay, I won't preach the sermon here, but there you go. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness. I'm reading it again, verse 26, halfway down there. He did it to demonstrate that his, his, his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just, and he declares, he declares, God, God does it through Jesus. He declares sinners to be right in his sight, when they believe in Jesus, when you turn to Jesus, like, I receive it, Lord, I repent, I come to you, give you all my sin. You can't pay for your sins, all right? Past, present, and future, you can't pay for it. You can't be good for it. You can't pay God back. You can't repent. You can't say enough prayers. You can't, you don't do it. You don't get it. Believing in Jesus is our redemption. Verse 27, can we boast then that we have done anything to be accepted by God? Now, no, because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law. It is based on faith. 
So we are made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. Wow, Lord. After all, is God the God of the Jews only? Isn't he also the God of the Gentiles? In other words, everybody else that's not a Jew, right? Of course he is. There's only one God. And he makes people right with himself only by faith, whether they're Jews or Gentiles. Well then, if we emphasize faith, does that mean that we can forget about the law? Of course not. In fact, only when we have faith do we truly fulfill the law. Oh, oh my gosh, this is, this is like, this is huge bungus, people. If you're, if you got a paper Bible, like five stars, ten stars, this is a major statement about how salvation works. If you've ever really wondered, or if you've got people that wonder, you know, this is why I tell people, read John, Acts, and Romans. Because the whole of the gospel is, is laid out in these three books. Ugh. Stunning. And Paul, you know, he wrote most of the New Testament, right? You know, okay, so there you go. That's chapter, end of chapter 3, and I'm going to pause there for the daily reading because that's worth, you may feel like, Carl, I've ne never heard of such a thing. Or you're like, yep, I get it, I've read it, and I read it again, and I'm amazed and grateful, and we should praise God for it because it's not us. Even though we want to live to please the Lord, we can't please him more by doing good. When we do well, or we're living more holy or righteous, however we do that, we're only doing what we're designed to do. That's the power of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. And yet we want to do those things because we love God, and we love to do it, and we're built to do it. But we never do it like, mm, I'm going to check off the box. Oh, more good deeds. God's going to love me more. Or I get saved more. Or somehow it helps Jesus save me because I've done good things. <laughs> That's We can spend our lives wondering, oh, did I do enough? I probably didn't do enough. We go to our graves and many people die thinking, I don't know if I was good enough. No, you're not. I don't care how good you are. <laughs> and I know a lot of good people. And so, all right, folks. This is powerful, and we, we need to comprehend. Be free. If you, if you believe in Jesus, you believe in Jesus. You're part of this finished work. You're, you're what Paul is speaking about right here. He declares sinners, all of us, to be right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. God bless you. See you tomorrow.